Welcome back for lesson two of my first unit on filmmaking, starting with filmmaking vocabulary. Last lesson we focused on mise-en-scene. For mise-en-scene, we talked about setting, set dressing, body language, facial expression, costume, and props. We also learned about the frame, the frame around these objects. The frame around your objects, the size of that frame, the shape of that frame, is determined by the camera. And today we're going to talk about the camera. I'd like to start with a couple questions. First off, what is the subject of a piece of music? Hopefully you know that a love song is about love. So the subject of that song is love. The subject of a sentence, that's the person, place, or thing that is doing the action in the sentence. Of The subject of a paragraph, that's the topic of the paragraph, what it's about. We can also use the word subject when we talk about paintings or photographs. The painter or the photographer is focusing on a person, place, or thing that is the subject of their painting or photograph. They don't always have to be in the middle of the image to be the subject of the image. And the subject of the image could be more than one thing. So just like in photos and paintings, the subject of a moving image in a movie is the thing or things that the camera is focused on. So it's going to be related to mise-en-scene. It's what we're seeing inside of the frame. But how can we change our point of view of the subject? How can we change the way that the viewer sees the subject using our camera? Using just the camera, we can change our point of view of the subject in a variety of ways. Think about it yourself. If you're taking a picture of a friend, you can get up close to that friend. You can stand far away from that friend. You can also get close to the ground and look up at your friend. Or you can stand on some stairs and look down on your friend. So there are different ways to change your point of view, and you probably understand them internally, but we need to make sure that you understand them from the perspective of filmmaking. You can change the point of view, the point from which you view something, by getting closer to it, or further away from it. So you can get closer to your subject to make the subject seem larger. You can get close to the ground and look up at the subject to make the subject look like it's bigger than the audience. So we look up at it and it looks big. Or you can get high up and look down at the subject and make the subject look small, like the audience is big and looking down at the subject. So you can change how we view the subject and you can also change how we feel as a viewer based on distance and angle. And those are the ways that we change our point of view of subjects in filmmaking. To start off, I wanna get the most, one of the most basic terms out of the way, and I want you to really internalize it. I want you to remember this, because so many students, so many young people make the mistake of using the wrong term when referring to this. One continuous piece of film, one continuous recording is a shot. A shot is just everything in between pressing record and pressing stop. That is one continuous shot. So when someone says, I like that shot, they're referring to one specific moment in between two cuts. If they want to refer to more cuts, more edits, a bigger piece, that's something else. And we'll use that vocab later on when we're talking about extending into an, a full edit. But when we're just talking about going out and recording, we record one shot at a time. And then you bring that into editing and you can build bigger things out of those shots. But we need to remember that a shot is just one continuous, unedited, uncut, piece of film. One continuous, unedited, uncut recording is the shot. What you're looking at here, if I hadn't cut out the breaks and the mistakes and the ums and the uhs and breathing, if I never cut any of that out in the edit, this would all be one continuous shot. I'm just sitting down in front of my camera, hit record, and then I'll hit record when I'm done. That, me that makes it one continuous shot. The only thing that breaks up those shots is when I go into editing to cut it up into pieces. If you've never been to the channel Rocket Jump Film School, I highly recommend it. And there's a specific video that hopefully I can link up here that I want you to watch. I would love for you to go watch their Cinematography 101 course video 
and then come back to this video to follow along. It's a great way to get hyped on speaking the language of cinematography. So hopefully you checked out that video from Rocket Jump. If you didn't, hopefully you go back and watch that at the end of this video. The first term that comes up is in fact cinematography. So cinematography is the art of motion picture photography. It's photography when you're talking about a still image and it's cinematography when you're talking about moving images. I'm gonna show you some quotes from famous cinematographers. Right now we're focusing on the camera, but remember cinematographers are also in charge of the lights. So both of these cinematographers can change the image using the camera and using lights. So here's our first quote, Roger Deakins. He's famous for these films and others. He says, we are storytelling. I help directors to tell the story they want in visual imagery. Visual imagery is the key phrase here. You are creating imagery with your camera. Never forget that. You're not just capturing what's in front of you. You are changing the way that the audience is going to see that subject. So you can actually inform the audience or make the audience feel a certain way about the subject based on how your camera is operated and also based on lighting. Next up, we have a quote from another famous cinematographer, Gordon Willis. Willis states, a cinematographer is a visual psychiatrist, moving an audience through a movie, making them think the way you want them to think. So Willis here is emphasizing this idea that you're not just pointing your camera at something, you're making the audience think about that subject in a certain way based on the way that they view that subject. Obviously, as someone, if you take pictures of yourself, you know that you can make people feel a certain way about you depending on the lighting and the angle and the point of view. And most of us are just thinking whether we look good or not. But you might not want your actor to look good. Think about moments in a movie where you want people to feel sorry for your subject or scared for your subject or scared of your subject, you can change the way people feel, not just by that actor's performance through the use of camera techniques and through lighting. So again, this lesson we're focusing on camera techniques and some of the basic ways to change a shot. Those two basic ways to change a shot are going to be the category of shot size and the category of camera angle. So on our list of vocab terms, A, capital A is shot size, and capital B is camera angle. So now we're going through shot sizes. We wanna make sure we have all of these in our vocabulary, even if we don't plan on being a permanent cinematographer. If you're going to be a director, a writer, any of the roles in filmmaking, it's important to know what shot sizes are and to be able to communicate them to your crew. Even if you are a sound designer, you are placing microphones inside of the shot. And in most movies, you don't have a microphone in the shot. So if you know that it's a close up, you know you can get the microphone really close to the actor without being in the shot. And if you think it's a medium shot, then it might have to be further away. So I will give you some of those terms in addition to the ones that I just mentioned. So shot size determines the size of the subject based on the distance of the camera from the subject and the type of lens used. So when I said you might not know if it's a medium shot unless the cinematographer told you, or you might not know if it's a close-up, that's because different lenses can zoom in to different distances. So you might be able to have the camera really far away without having uh, a long shot. It might be a close-up from a long distance. When you're using a phone and you only have one camera on that phone, then you are mostly going to be dealing with a wide-angle lens. And so to get a close-up, you're going to have to get very close to your subject. So we're going to go from one extreme to another as we go through the ver variety of distances from which we can view our subjects. First up, we have the extreme long shot. The extreme long shot is going to emphasize the environment around your subject. When we talked about mise-en-scene, we talked about setting and set dressing. So the extreme long shot is going to really emphasize the setting and the set dressing, and your subject is going to look very small inside of the frame. The extreme long shot is a very common technique used to start a scene. It kind of lets your audience know where everyone is. It lets them see where people are. It might be confusing to start a scene or to start a movie in a close-up. However, if you start in an extreme long shot, your audience might feel like they have a better understanding of the space around the actors. So when you punch in closer, they still kind of understand where everyone is in the setting. It 
helps to orient the audience to the environment of that location. Next up we have the long shot. So like I said, we're going from one extreme very far away to the other extreme very close. So after the extreme long shot, we have the long shot. And we're going to base most of these on the subject of a human being. So when we're looking at people, a long shot is meant to refer to a shot that starts at the bottom of the feet and goes to the top of the head. There's always, or typically, going to be a little bit of room in between the feet and the bottom of the frame and the top of the head and the top of the frame. But a long shot is meant to mainly focus on the full body of the actor. In other words, a long shot is a shot that's far enough away to fit the entire subject in the frame, and mainly when we're referring to a person. If you fit the entire basketball in a frame of an image, you probably won't hear someone refer to that as a long shot because a basketball is not as big as a human being. Next up, we have the medium long shot. So we started farther away. Imagine you're on your phone taking a photograph horizontally. You have to stand pretty far away for the extreme long shot. For the long shot, you have to stand a comfortable distance. For the medium long shot, you're going to start getting closer up to your subject. And this is a shot that's going to cut off at about the knees and stop at about the top of the head. For the medium long shot, we're intentionally cutting off most of the the lower half of the actor's legs because we want the body language to mainly focus on the top three-fourths of the body because the body language is mainly focusing on the uh, thighs, the upper body, and the facial expression. So this is also referred to as the cowboy shot because you can still get the body language of a cowboy drawing a pistol from his hip using the shot, so it's pretty common in westerns. It's also known as the three-quarter shot because if you cut yourself up into four parts, into quarters, and you only use three of those quarters starting from the top, then you'd stop at your knees. Then we have the medium shot. So we're getting even closer. The medium shot is going to cut off at the waist. And if you think about what you're showing the audience, you're showing the audience upper body language and facial expression. So a medium shot can be great for showing an actor's performance physically and on their face but you're not emphasizing their entire body. This is also known as a waist shot because it cuts off at the actor's waist. Again, this is going to frame the actor's torso, arms, and head. Getting in even closer to our subject now, we have the medium close-up shot. So if you're shooting on your phone horizontally, you're getting pretty close to the person that you're recording if you're doing a medium close-up shot. So you're cutting off at the middle of the chest usually and going to the top of the head. And this shows a little bit of body language, but not a lot. It's mainly focused on facial expression at this point. Next, we're going to go even closer. And this is the close-up. The close-up, if you're on a phone, is really close to your actor's face. The close-up is only focused on facial expressions. It frames the actor's face. It's going to cut off at around the middle of the neck and it can go all the way to the top of the head, but it doesn't have to. Next up, we are even closer, and if you're on a phone with a wide lens, this is really, really close to someone's face. This is the extreme close-up. Again, if you don't have a zoom lens, you are really close to someone's face if you're not zoomed in digitally on your phone. This is going to just frame a specific detail. So if you are using the basketball example, a close-up would be the entire basketball. Imagine you're framing someone's head. It's like doing that. So we would call a close-up on a basketball uh, whenever you have the whole basketball in the image. An extreme close-up up on a basketball might only show the word spalding or it might only show the bumps on the basketball. So an extreme close-up on a person is only going to show one feature of that person like their eyes or their mouth. This type of shot is so tight that it only frames one detail of the subject such as the subject's facial features. So I have some questions to follow up on our vocab list. Hopefully you kept up and added the vocab terms to your vocabulary list for shot sizes. My first question is, what shot would you use to emphasize facial expression? There are a few options here. Most of you probably said close-up. Hopefully you also mentioned medium close-up because it does emphasize facial expression. And you might even use an extreme close-up if you just wanted to show one piece of the facial expression. Next up, what type of shot would you use to emphasize body language? Some of you may have mentioned the long shot because it frames the entire body 
of the subject. You may also mention medium long shot because while it cuts off part of the actor's legs, it's still mainly focused on body language with a little bit more of the face in the picture. What type of shot equally balances the emphasis on body language and facial expression? Well, when we think of the word medium, we do think of balance. The medium shot is going to give you some of the actor's physical performance, but we're close enough to where we can really see what's on their face. So a medium shot is going to equally balance the actor's physical body language with their facial expression. What type of shot emphasizes the environment more than the subject? Hopefully you mentioned the extreme long shot. As I mentioned before, it's commonly used at the beginning of a movie or a scene. It helps to start out far away, showing the audience everything, and then going in close so that the audience kind of has an idea of where everyone is and where everyone is looking. It helps the editor give the audience some understanding of where you are. Next up, we have camera angle. And when we talk about point of view, it's in the definition. The point of view from which the camera views the subject is the camera angle. So while distance does have a factor in where we see the subject from, camera angle has a huge impact on how we view that subject. Whether we view that subject as huge and looming over us or tiny and below us. You can see in these examples that the angle of a shot really changes how we feel about what we're looking at. So angle is going to be a hugely important factor in filmmaking. Again, we'll start from one extreme and move to the other extreme, starting with the bird's eye view or the God's eye view. The bird's eye view views the subject from directly above. The camera is directly above the subject looking down at it. Next up, we have the high angle shot. The high angle shot is above the subject and looking down at it. This usually gives you the feeling of being a taller individual looking down at a smaller individual. This isn't a bird's eye view, but it is the point of view of looking down at someone or something that is on a lower level. To achieve this camera angle, the camera is higher than the subject and looking down at the subject. And this is a term that a lot of people get wrong. You'll see why. Because the subject is lower, they want to say that it's a lower shot, but it's a high angle shot because the camera is high. So just remember, when we're talking about angles, we're not talking so much about the subject here, we're talking about the camera and the camera is high, and since the subject is lower than the camera, the camera is looking down. So this is the high angle looking down at the subject. Next up we have eye level, and this shot right here is pretty much an eye level shot. It's when the camera is level, usually with the actor's face, but not always, but we do call it eye level because of that, because we're usually recording people, and the main thing you wanna capture usually is the actor's facial expressions, performance. So we're going to be level with the actor so that they don't look distorted, so that they don't look too tall or too short until there's a reason why we want them to look shorter or taller. Perhaps they are overcoming an obstacle and they we want them to look more powerful, then we might make them look taller. If we want them to look scared and alone, we might make them look smaller. So an eye level shot is like a neutral shot. It doesn't have as much sway on how we feel about the subject. It's the realism that we most of the time want. To achieve this camera angle, the camera is level with the subject, and as we normally expect to see the subject, this is the most common camera angle in filmmaking. So you don't want to get too crazy. The eye level is what you'll see most often. Next up we have low angle. So we've gone from one extreme, bird's eye view, and we're going down, and after eye level, now we're below the subject. So again, remember, don't get this confused with high angle. A low angle is going to be low because the camera is low. So the camera is below the subject. It's lower to the ground, looking up at the subject. To achieve this camera angle, the camera is lower than the subject, looking up at it. And again, this could make the subject look powerful, menacing. Um, you will often use this when you're looking up at a villain that's scary or at a superhero who's impressive. 
And the last part of this extreme of the high angle, low angle, is the worm's eye view. So it's easy to remember this term if you know bird's eye view because birds are up high and they eat worms which are down low. A worm's eye view places the camera on the ground looking up at the subject. This is the most extreme version of the low angle. It's shot from the ground level looking up at the subject. There's one other angle that's not quite like the other camera angles. With the high angle, we are up looking down at the subject. Imagine this is the front of the camera. And then with a low angle, you see this motion. This rotation is different than the last angle we're going to talk about. The last angle we're going to talk about rotates the camera on the roll axis. So imagine you are rotating your head like this. The camera body itself is going to turn and rotate. It's rotating on the roll axis. It's like if you moved your head from one shoulder to the other shoulder. However, our brain automatically keeps that image level. You'll notice that if you test it out yourself. When you're looking at a straight line, a vertical line up and down, turn your head to one shoulder that line doesn't move with your head turn. However, a camera doesn't have the same technology in our brains to balance that out. So when a camera turns to one shoulder or rolls, the camera actually turns those lines. Those lines roll with the camera. And so our next camera angle and the last one in our list is the Dutch angle. The Dutch angle is also known as the canted angle because when you have something canted, let's say there's a painting on the wall that's crooked, we refer to that as canted. But a Dutch angle gets its name from the Dutch. So this comes from a special form of filmmaking that arose at one point in time. So to achieve this angle, the camera is rotated on the axis of the lens. It turns vertical lines and horizontal lines into diagonal lines. So you're not turning the camera so much that you have a vertical image. You're just turning it enough about halfway between, between horizontal and vertical to make all of the lines diagonal. So when you look at the horizon line where the sun meets the earth or the sky meets the earth, that's usually straight across. But when you point your camera at that, if it's a little bit off, that line might be diagonal. So if you intentionally do that, if you intentionally turn your camera to make that horizon line diagonal, you're creating a Dutch angle. So some follow-up questions now that we've gone over all of the angles. Which angle would diminish your subject? To diminish something means to reduce it in size or value, to make something seem less impressive. Hopefully you mentioned the high angle. You might have messed up and said low angle. Remember, the high angle puts the camera up high, so the subject seem smaller. Looking down at that subject makes the subject seem smaller. What emotional or psychological state would this convey by using this camera angle? It may mean that the character we're looking at is scared or frightened or weak or vulnerable. So a high angle looking down at a subject can tell the audience something that they might not realize consciously, but psychologically, subconsciously, they feel it. The character is in danger or the character is scared. What type of camera angle aggrandizes the subject? To aggrandize someone or something means to make that person or thing greater or to seem magnified. So what shots would make your subject seem greater or magnified? If we're talking about camera angle, you're going to be referring to the low angle. Don't get that mixed up with the high angle. Remember, the low angle is when the camera is low, closer to the ground, looking up at the subject. So you're going to make your subject seem to tower, to seem big and important and powerful. Again, this can be used for a villain to make them seem more intimidating or scary, and it can be used for a hero to make them seem more powerful and confident. What type of camera angle is the most common camera angle? From our definitions, you should be able to remember. This is the camera angle that shoots your subject 
on its same level. So when we're talking about people, we're talking about eye level. We're on level with the subject. We're using an eye level camera angle. Why is this point of view the most common? Remember, it's the most common because we don't always want our audience to feel that the subject is weak or powerful. Sometimes we want the subject to be seen in a more realistic point of view. It's what's expected most of the time. But again, a cinematographer can make their own decisions on camera angle to impact the audience in different ways. However, if they don't want to use extreme angles, they're going to use the eye level. What type of camera angle would make your subject seem unstable? Maybe you want them to seem crazy, or maybe you want them to look like they're off balance, or like they might do something dangerous. You would want to use, or could use, the Dutch angle. What emotional or psychological state could you convey with the Dutch angle? A Dutch angle might mean that someone is out of control or that the situation is getting weird. So now we have our mise-en-scene terms and we also have some cinematography terms. Again, for mise-en-scene, we have setting, set dressing, props, costume, body language, facial expression, and blocking. And for cinematography, we have the various shot sizes. Those are created or referred to as distances, close and long. And we have the camera angles. Those are referred to from the position of the camera. So the camera is high or low. Using this vocabulary, let's analyze some images. Starting with this image from The Lost Weekend, a 1945 film. What kind of camera angle is this shot using? Some might have mentioned eye level, but if it were eye level, we'd be looking more straightforward at the subject. The subject and the chair that he's sitting in is actually lower than the camera. So we're actually looking at a slightly high angle shot. What do the mise-en-scene elements tell us about this character? How about the props? What about the costume? Maybe he was just at work. Maybe he's tired or exhausted from work. What about his facial expression? He, does he seem relaxed? No, he looks stressed out or confused, or rattled. So all of these elements combine. Remember, these are film elements, and this class is all about analyzing film elements and learning how to use them. So combining mise-en-scene and cinematography, we can choose what we show the audience and choose what elements will speak to the audience in the way that we want them to understand the subject. Not only angle, but also shot size is important. What shot size is being used in this image? Hopefully you're not saying long shot because we're not seeing the whole body of the subject. Hopefully you're not saying close up because we're not just framing the subject's face. Remember, which shot cuts off at the waist? The medium shot. So this is a medium shot of our subject. His clothes look disheveled. His costume looks disheveled. His prop the glass of liquor seems to indicate that he's been drinking his facial expression indicates that he's uncomfortable or disturbed next up we have a shot from all the president's men a 1976 film what camera angle are we looking at here i'll give you a hint we're looking into a library with many many people sitting at desks it might have been hard to tell what you're looking at at first but hopefully now you realize you're looking at a bird's eye view of this group of people. We can't really make out any of the people individually. What shot size are we looking at? Hopefully you guessed it, an extreme long shot. We're mainly observing this environment from a great distance. Next up, we have a shot from The Godfather, a 1972 film. When we're choosing shot size, when you have a shot with so many people, you probably just want to choose the answer that's the most correct based on a variety of subjects. So by looking at these subjects, what shot size are we looking at? If you could see where each subject's legs were, you'd probably see this shot cuts off at about their knees. So hopefully you would mention that this is about a medium long shot. It's not a long shot. No one would fit in this image from foot to head, but it's not a close up either. And it's not a medium so this would most easily be defined as a medium long shot. Look at the mise-en-scene. What does this tell you about the class of people in this shot? Do they seem poor, middle class, or wealthy? 
the setting, the set dressing, the costumes, they all indicate that this is a powerful group of people, maybe a family or a group of friends. What about the camera angle? What's the camera angle of this shot? So again, you probably want to just look at all of the subjects to get a general idea of the camera angle. And based on the fact that most of them are seated and the camera is level with their heads, you can call this an eye level shot. Next up, we have an image from Annie Hall, a 1977 film. What does the facial expression of the main actor tell you about his mood or his personality? Perhaps someone cut in line and he's annoyed or he doesn't want to see the movie that they're going to see. Maybe the man behind him is saying something that he doesn't agree with. What about the facial expression on the female actor to his side? She looks annoyed, pissed off, like she can't stand being with him. You can analyze the costumes here, obviously. Body language, facial expression. What about camera? What type of shot is this? Well, looking at where it cuts off on the subject, this mainly cuts off on people's waists. So again, we're looking at a medium shot. Medium shots are great for emphasizing both body language and facial expression equally. And so the body language of the main actor and facial expression are both emphasized. Next up, we have a shot from Manhattan. What type of shot size are we looking at? If we see so much of this environment, and see that the subjects are smaller in the frame, you guessed it, this is an extreme long shot. As far as angle is concerned, there's no extreme high or low, so we can refer to this as an eye level shot. And we can't see much of the costumes, body language, or facial expressions because of the extreme long shot nature of the shot. We're mainly focused on the environment while we listen to the audio of their conversation. Next up, we have a shot from No Country for Old Men. This is a 2007 film. We're looking at the villain of the movie. What camera angle is the cinematographer using to emphasize the power and dangerous nature of this villain? You guessed it, it's a low angle. Hopefully you didn't say high angle. Remember, it's low angle because the camera is low, looking up at the subject. The subject seems big and powerful, menacing and scary because of the angle of this camera. What size shot is this? Hopefully you didn't say close-up. Remember, a close-up is mainly focusing on the actor's face, framing their face, but this shot doesn't just frame the actor's face. It cuts off at about mid-chest, so this would be a medium close-up. Next up, we have a shot from Skyfall, a 2012 film. What size is this shot size? You guessed it again, an extreme long shot. The subject is small, and we're mainly focused on the environment. The setting, when we're talking about mise-en-scene, is this outdoor environment in the mountains. Next up, we have a shot from 12 Monkeys. This is a 1995 film. Here you can see that the characters are in an insane asylum, and this camera angle emphasizes their insanity. So again, which camera angle would you use to make your subject seem unhinged or off-kilter, unbalanced? Again, this camera angle can really emphasize the strangeness of a shot. And in this case, we are emphasizing the strangeness of both the environment and the character's psychologies, since they're in this insane asylum. This camera angle, hopefully you guessed it, is the Dutch angle, also known as the canted angle. It is the camera angle that makes straight lines look diagonal. So you can see the lines that normally would go straight across the hallway look like diagonal lines. The lines of the television are diagonal. In fact, all of the lines in this shot are diagonal lines in the environment because the camera is rotated on the axis of the lens. So we're still looking in the same direction, but turning the body of the camera. Next up, we have a shot from Silence. This is a 2016 film. What shot size are we looking at here? Since the characters are seated or kneeling, this shot size still captures the entire subject within the frame, but it's not so extreme that we can't see the subject very well. We see some facial expression and a lot of body language, so this would be a long shot. What camera angle are we viewing in this image? Hopefully you guessed high level. There's not a lot of angle to this shot. It's balanced, it's neutral, it's letting the subject in the mise-en-scene 
convey the information less than the camera angle. Next up we have a shot from Blade Runner. This is a 1982 film. What stands out to you about the mise-en-scene in this image? Facial expression stands out pretty prominently. Facial expression is emphasized in this shot. So what shot size is the cinematographer choosing to use to emphasize the actor's powerful facial expression? Hopefully you guessed it. This is a close-up. It's framing the actor's face. Next up, we have a shot from Fight Club. This is a 1999 film. What camera angle are we looking at in this shot? I'll give you a hint. These characters have tackled and cornered an individual, and we're looking at them from the individual's point of view. We are on the ground looking up at them. So what kind of camera angle could you call this? Hopefully you guessed it, the worm's eye view. You could also call it an extreme low angle. We're on the ground looking up at the subject. Next up, we have an image from Silence of the Lambs. This is a 1991 film. What shot size is being used here to really emphasize the actor's facial expression, specifically the actor's eyes? This is not a standard close-up. We're not framing the entire face. And remember, a close-up is mainly going to start at the bottom of the head and end at the top of the head. This is nearing an extreme close-up. So you can refer to this image, this shot, as an extreme close-up. Next up, we have an image from Dunkirk. This is a 2017 film. Sticking with shot sizes, what shot size are we looking at? It's emphasizing a little bit of the actor's body language, but mainly his facial expression. It's starting mid-chest and going to the top of his head. What shot size would that be? Hopefully you guessed it, this is a medium close-up. Next up we have a shot from Kill Bill Volume 1. This film is from 2003. What shot size would we refer to this as? This shot cuts off at the waist and ends above the actor's head, so we would call this a medium shot. Is there a camera angle to this shot? The character certainly seems powerful. Are we looking at her from eye level? I would say it's slightly low angle. We're looking up at the subject to make her seem a little bit more intimidating. We're not right on that line to be level with the actress. We are looking up at her slightly. Next up, we have a shot from Skyfall. This is a 2012 film. What size would this shot be? This shot cuts off at the knees and ends at the top of the head. Although we see a ton of environment, this is not an extreme long shot. This would be the cowboy shot, the three quarter shot, the medium long shot. Next up, we have a shot from American Gangster. This is a 2007 film. This shot does not cut off at the knees. It goes all the way down to the actor's feet and cuts off above his head. This shot still shows quite a bit of environment, but it's not so extreme that we can't see the actor's facial expression or body language very well. We see them quite well. This is a long shot. So now that we've gone over all of the different shot sizes and camera angles, I've got a challenge for you. I want you to try to capture an example for every single one of these terms. So when you are shooting the distances, the shot sizes, you can use your phone. Make sure you shoot horizontally. You don't want to shoot vertical images like on TikTok or Instagram. We're going to shoot widescreen like most films we see. So turn your camera sideways and record horizontally. You're going to do that for all of this class. So make sure you remember to record videos and images that way. For this practice example, you can just take still images. I would encourage you to just take still pictures for this to get started practicing your shot sizes and camera angles. There are 13 in total. So you should turn in 13 pictures if you're in my class. And if you're not in my class, for practice, try to take all 13. So you can use a cell phone or a camcorder. You're going to obtain the seven different shot sizes. And when you record the shot sizes, just use eye level. So record the shot sizes with zero degrees of angle. Straight on, you're going to record your from the extreme long shot to the extreme close up and everything in between straightforward straight ahead and balanced 
without any extreme lows or extreme highs to the camera's angle. Then I want you to take six different images for the six different angles. So you'll have an eye level shot even though you already took a close up, a medium close up, a long shot from eye level. Take another shot any distance you choose for your eye level example. Take a low angle shot. Make sure you're aiming at a subject. They don't have to be in the very center of the frame. They could be off to the left or off to the right, but make sure that subject is looking taller and more aggrandized, more powerful, greater than it normally would. That can be a person, a pet, or a thing that you're taking a picture of from the camera lower to the ground looking up at the subject. You're obviously going to try to achieve a high angle, so maybe stand up on a chair or boost yourself in some way to look down on the subject. The subject again could be a person, an animal, or a thing that you're looking down at for your high angle shot. Get creative with your shots. Try to take shots of different points of view, behind, in front of. If you're choosing the same subject for every shot, try to get some variety in there. You can move around the subject to different points around the subject, behind it, in front of it, beside it, and try out these different techniques of distance and angle. Make sure you have a checklist so that you don't forget any of them. And when you upload them, make sure you name them so that you can remember them for further studies. So I recommend every one does this activity and places the images into their film folder. You can put it in a folder called Shot Practice. You can always go back to these images as a study guide that you yourself made and as practice for remembering what each shot size and camera angle is. If you're choosing a human subject, please tell that person not to stare into the camera. Remember, this is not a photo for someone's profile picture. This is practicing to be a future filmmaker. And remember, in most shots in film, the actor is not supposed to act like there's a camera there at all. So they will not look directly into the camera. If they want to look toward the camera, they can look at the hand that's holding the camera, or at your shoulder, or slightly off to the side, but never directly into the lens like I'm doing now, to give you the feel for shooting a film instead of shooting a vlog or a tutorial like this video. And if you're using a human subject, or even if you're not, try to use the shots for their intended purpose. An extreme close-up is going to emphasize a detail of someone's facial expression, but it could emphasize another detail, like a small scratch on the side of a car, for example. You might use an extreme close-up to point out a very specific detail that the audience would otherwise miss. So try to use these shots for their intended purpose. An extreme long shot to show off an environment, to show the audience the surroundings, to show us the setting of a scene. Have fun, but also keep all of these things in mind so that you don't have to repeat the process. If you're in my class, you want to have everything from the list, at least one great example Example. And you want to make sure you shoot these horizontally. If you're using a phone, make sure to turn that phone to its horizontal view, the widescreen point of view on your phone. And remember, you don't have to record videos. You can just take still images for this example, getting started with camera techniques. Again, you want to upload these 13 photos to your film folder as practice examples, and you want to rename each file with the proper vocab term so that you can go back to study these and remember them. You can put them in a subfolder. You can put a folder inside of your film folder and call it shot type challenge or shot challenge, and you want to rename each file. If you're in a Google Drive, you can right-click the file and choose to rename it. You want to make sure you rename it with the correct vocab term, so don't just do it from memory, make sure to go back to your vocab list. Lastly, we're going to finish up with one more little example. In these images, you can see that the shots have similarities. What is the similarity between each shot? Well, in the shot on the left and the shot on the right, you can probably see that paper is involved as a prop. One character is picking up and reading a piece of paper, and one character is ripping a paper in half. But in the image in the middle, there's no paper involved, but they all three have something in common. What is it? 
If you're thinking it's medium shots, well, the image on the left isn't quite a medium shot. The image in the middle is definitely a medium close-up, and the image on the right is a medium shot cutting off at the waist. So the shot sizes aren't exactly the same. What about camera angle? Well, the image on the far right is close to a worm's eye view. It is low to the ground. The image on the left is a low angle looking up, and the image in the middle is also a low angle looking up. So all three images are lower than eye level. So we've mentioned the similarities. What about the differences? You can see the image on the left. The character looks distressed. Her facial expression indicates fear or being disturbed. The image in the middle, the character does not seem distressed. He seems calm and collected. In the image on the right, the character seems overconfident or cocky from his facial expression. How are the psychological effects of these images different? You can see the image on the left, the low angle, distorts the size of the subject, but also the size of the typewriter machine where she's pulling the paper. So maybe it's to emphasize that this big discovery in the movie The Shining is what terrifies her or is what's creating her terror. The low angle in the middle shot allows us to see the big bird on the wall which kind of hovers over the character. So maybe the psychological reasoning for the low angle is not only to make him seem confident and collected, but also to emphasize some of the mise-en-scene, the decorations in the room. And the low angle on the image in the far right complements the confidence and cockiness of the character ripping up the papers. Thank you for watching this lesson on shot sizes and camera angles. Hopefully you're excited to be talking the language of cinematography now. And I would highly encourage those people who are not my students to still try this activity. Try out all the different shot sizes that you can capture on your phone and try out a variety of camera angles. Thanks for watching and I'll catch up with you in lesson three.